Shall we bow our heads for prayer? Father in heaven, what a joy it is to be in your house of worship on your holy Sabbath. We thank you for this oasis in time. We thank you that we're able to forget everything ours so that we can focus on everything yours. We ask Father that as we open your word that your Holy Spirit will be with us to instruct us and to guide us. Help us to learn the lessons which will be useful in our own personal walk with Jesus. And we thank you Father for hearing our prayer for we ask it in Jesus name. Amen. I would like us to begin our study this morning at Psalm 8 and we will read verses 3 through 5. If you remember we're studying now a series titled The Law of Life and Death. And today is the second sermon in this six part series titled The Law of Life and Death. What I want us to notice in this passage is that God placed Adam on the throne as the ruler of planet earth at the very beginning of human history. It says there in Psalm 8 and verse 3, the psalmist speaking, When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you visit him? For you have made him, speaking about the creation of Adam, for you have made him a little lower than the angels and you have crowned him, notice this is the idea of a coronation, you have crowned him with glory and honor and notice he has a territory which God gave him. You have made him to have dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, even the beasts of the field, the birds of the air, and the fish of the sea that pass through the paths of the sea. Clearly God placed Adam as the king of planet earth at the very beginning. And he placed a crown on his head according to this passage. But when Adam chose Satan as his sovereign, Satan took over the throne and Adam lost his dominion. Let's read about that in Luke chapter 4 and verses 5 through 7. Luke chapter 4 and verses 5 through 7. This is the moment when the devil takes Jesus to a very high mountain. And it says there in verse 5, Then the devil, taking him up on a high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said to him, All this authority I will give you and their glory. For this has been delivered to me and I give it to whomever I wish. Therefore, if you will worship before me, all will be yours. So basically the devil is saying to Jesus, this kingdom or these kingdoms have been delivered to me, and I give these kingdoms to whomever I wish. Originally we notice that the kingdom was given to Adam. But now Satan is claiming the kingdoms of this world. And he's actually offering these kingdoms to Jesus. It becomes very obvious that after Adam sinned, the kingdoms of this world were taken over by usurpation from the hands of Adam. And therefore, the human race needed someone to come and recover that which had been lost. But the Bible says that there was no one within humanity who could actually come and defeat the devil because everyone had already been defeated by the devil. 
we find in Romans chapter 3 and verse 10 there is none righteous no not one in Romans 3 verse 23 all have sinned and come short of the glory of God there was no one within the human race who could recover the throne and the dominion which Adam had given over to Satan as the ruler of this world and so it became necessary that Jesus the creator of the whole human race become incarnate so that he could recover the throne and he could recover the crown now it's important to notice the way in which Jesus did this you know in heaven he was a king he had a crown he had his throne you would have thought that he would have said okay Satan you stole the throne I'll knock you off and I'll just restore the throne but that's not the way it happened you see in order for Jesus to recover the throne he had to get down from his throne in heaven and he had to come to this world in a very strange and unexpected way do you realize that the last week of the life of Jesus before his death on Calvary actually was the process of his coronation as a king you know we usually read those texts where it speaks about Jesus coming on his throne of glory with all of his angels and having a crown within a crown on his head and we think that this is the description of Jesus as king but there is another description of Jesus as king which is very very strange let's notice John chapter 12 and verses 12 through 15 this passage is speaking about the procession of Jesus he's coming into Jerusalem as a prince and as a prince he is going to be eventually crowned as king and he is going to be placed on his throne this is known as the triumphal entry it is taking place on what Christians call Palm Sunday I want you to notice the kingly terminology that you have in this passage it says there beginning at verse 12 the next day a great multitude that had come to the feast when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him and cried out Hosanna blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord the King of Israel do you see that they're proclaiming Jesus King? he's entering Jerusalem as a prince and the multitudes are crying out Hosanna blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord the King of Israel then Jesus when he had found a young donkey sat on it as it is written fear not daughter of Zion behold your King is coming sitting on a donkey's colt so you'll notice that Jesus enters Jerusalem in this triumphal entry and he's being acclaimed as a king by the multitudes in fact he sits on a donkey which was a sign of royalty this is the procession of Jesus as the prince he's coming to Jerusalem to be crowned as king now it's interesting to notice in John chapter 12 in verses 31 to 33 that the Lord Jesus predicted this is taking place by the way only three days before the death of Jesus what we're going to read now Jesus is predicting that he is going to cast out the present ruler at that time of this world by what he was going to do in Jerusalem notice John chapter 12 and verses 31 to 33 you see this world had a prince this world had a ruler he had taken it from Adam now Jesus is saying just a few days before his death on the cross he's saying I'm going to take this individual off the throne and I'm going to be the new ruler by what I'm going to do in Jerusalem notice now is the judgment of this world now the ruler of this world will be cast out and I if I am lifted up from the earth will draw all peoples to myself this he said signifying by what death he would die 
He was saying when I hang on the cross, when I say it is finished, I am going to knock off the present ruler of this world who took the throne from the original ruler from Adam. In other words he's saying I'm going to lay stake to my throne and I'm going to lay stake to my crown. But this was a strange king. Very unusual king. Now every king in order to be king needs to be anointed. Would you agree with that? Interestingly enough after the triumphal entry you find the anointing of this king. Notice Matthew chapter 26 and verses 1 and 2 and while you're looking for Matthew 26 1 and 2 let me ask you where were kings anointed? On what part of their body? On their heads. And what were they anointed with? They were anointed with oil. Now notice what we find in Matthew 26 and verses 1 and 2. Now it came to pass when Jesus had finished all these sayings that he said to his disciples you know that after two days is the Passover and the Son of Man will be delivered up to be crucified. By the way that means to be enthroned. We're going to notice that a little bit later. Let's jump down to verse 6. And when Jesus was in Bethany at the house of Simon the leper, a woman came to him having an alabaster flask of very costly fragrant oil. Now some places say that it doesn't say, don't say that it was oil, but I want you to notice, I'll just mention this text in passing, Luke 7 verse 46, Jesus says, my head with oil thou didst not anoint, he's saying to Simon, you did anoint my head with oil, but this woman hath anointed my feet with ointment. So what this woman was using was oil, and where did she anoint Jesus? Verse 7 again, a woman came to him having the, an alabaster flask of costly fragrant oil, and she poured it on his what? on his head as he sat at the table. But when his disciples saw it they were indignant saying, why this waste? For this fragrant oil might have been sold for much and given to the poor. But when Jesus was aware of it he said to them, why do you trouble the woman? For she has done a good work for me, for you have the poor with you always, but me you do not have always, for in pouring this fragrant oil on my body she did it for my burial. So we find Jesus entering as a triumphant prince into Jerusalem, and now he is anointed with oil on his head. He's being anointed as a king. But this is quite a strange king. Now all kings need to have a crown, don't they? Therefore Jesus had to have a crown as well, but it's a rather strange crown. Notice John chapter 19 and verses 2 and 3. John chapter 19 and verses 2 and 3. Jesus had a crown, but it was a strange crown. It says there in verse 2, and the soldiers twisted a crown of thorns. Hmm, isn't that kind of a strange crown for a king? And put it on his head and they put on a purple robe, then they said, notice they're rendering him homage as a king, then they said, Hail King of the Jews! And they struck him with their hands. And so this king who has this triumphal procession into Jerusalem as the prince who is going to be crowned, who is anointed on his head with oil, to be the king, now a crown is placed on his head, but it is a crown of thorns. Now every king needs to have special garments, and the special garments of course are to be a certain color. Kings actually were garbed in purple, that was the royal color, and so Jesus if he was going to be a king had to be robed in purple. Notice John chapter 19 and verses 2 and 3 once again, and the soldiers twisted a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they put on him what? 
a purple robe. Then they said, Hail, King of the Jews! And they struck him with their hands. So Jesus the King wears a purple robe. They place a crown of thorns on his head. It's the crown of a king. He has his anointing service separating him as king. And he enters triumphantly in Jerusalem as the prince who is going to be crowned. But now every king needs to be recognized by his subjects and needs to be honored and glorified by his subjects. And so of course Jesus had to also receive homage from his subjects. But the interesting thing is they acclaim him as king but they acclaim him in a mocking manner. Notice Mark chapter 15 and verses 17 through 19. Mark chapter 15 and verses 17 through 19. And they clothed him with purple. And they twisted a crown of thorns. Put it on his head. And began to salute him. See, like the multitudes would do in case that a king is coming and is going to be crowned. You know they are going to honor and glorify him and sing out his praises. But this is a strange way for the people to recognize this king. It says, and they began to salute him. Hail! King of the Jews. Then they struck him on the head with a reed and spat on him and bowing the knee. They what? And bowing the knee they worshiped him. But all of this was done by his subjects mockingly. Normally a king when he's recognized the multitudes would actually praise him in a sincere and honest way in a loving way. Now every king also has to have a scepter in his right hand, which is a symbol of his rulership. Therefore Jesus also had to have a scepter in his right hand. Notice Matthew chapter 27 and verse 29. Matthew chapter 27 and verse 29. Jesus had his scepter as well. He's going through a process of coronation as king. Strange king that we find here. It says, and when they had twisted a crown of thorns, they put it on his head, and a reed in his right hand. See, that's the scepter. And they bowed the knee before him, and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. So Jesus has his crown. He has his scepter. He has his purple robes. He had his anointing service. The people acclaim him mockingly as king. Was Jesus really a king? All of the evidence seems to indicate so. In fact in Matthew 27 verse 11 which we won't look up now, Jesus had a private interview with Pilate, with Pontius Pilate. Pilate asked him, are you a king? Jesus says, yes, but I'm not the type of king that you think I am. I am not a glorious king who's going to take away your throne and sit on the throne of Rome. He says, I am a king, but my kingdom right now is not of this world. And then when Pilate brings out Jesus before the Jews, I want you to notice how he introduces Jesus. John chapter 19 and verses 14 and 15. John 19 and verses 14 and 15. Now it was the preparation day of the Passover and about the sixth hour. And he said to the Jews, Behold your what? Behold your king. But they cried out, Away with him! Away with him! Crucify him! Pilate said to him, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. So Pilate recognized that Jesus was a king. He introduces Jesus as a king. In a private interview, Jesus says, I am a king. And then Jesus is taken on the procession to the place of his coronation. But it's a strange procession. 
It's known commonly among Christians as the Via Dolorosa, the way of sorrow and pain. You see, he's going on the procession because they're going to place him on his throne. But we're going to notice that the throne is actually a cross. What a strange way to be recognized as a king, to be placed on a throne which is actually a cross. Notice what we find in Matthew 27 and verses 31 to 33. And when they had mocked him, they took the robe off him, and put his own clothes on him, and led him away to be crucified. Now as they came out they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name, him they compelled to bear his cross, and when they had come to a place called Golgotha, that is to say, the place of a skull. So you have, you have here the procession of Jesus to the place of his coronation, to the place where he's going to be put upon the throne. Now you know it's very interesting that the book of Acts describes this coronation and enthronement ceremony by quoting a prophecy from the Old Testament. Turn with me to Acts chapter 4 and verses 25 to 27. In case you haven't recognized now that the last week of the life of Jesus before his death was a process of coronation as a king. This will seal it. Acts chapter 4 verses 25 and 27. Here Peter is reminiscing about the moment when Annas, Caiaphas, the Jewish leaders, Herod and Pilate gathered around Jesus mockingly to destroy him. And I want you to notice that Peter quotes a very interesting passage from the Old Testament. Let's begin at verse 24 of Acts chapter 4. So, when they heard that, they raised their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, you are God, who made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them, who by the mouth of your servant David have said, why did the nations rage? Do you know where he's quoting from? Psalm 2, a very important psalm. Why did the nations rage and the people plot vain things? The kings of the earth took their stand and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. For truly against your holy servant Jesus whom you anointed both Herod and Pontius Pilate with the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together to do whatever your hand and your purpose determined before to be done. Now why would this passage be quoted as referring to the moment when the leaders of Israel and when Pilate and Herod gathered around Jesus to mock him. We need to know the original historical context of Psalm 2. You see Psalm 2 is speaking about David's coronation day. And God is placing David as his servant on the throne. And at the same time that David is being placed on the throne, the surrounding nations with their kings are conspiring to overthrow him before he wins over the sympathy of the people. They say if we can knock him off early, then he won't have the confidence of the people and will be able to overcome him. Interesting that this passage in Psalm 2 which applies originally to the coronation of David and the nations conspiring against him as the king of Israel is used to refer to Jesus who is also being crowned as a king and the nations are conspiring against Jesus Christ. So this passage makes it very clear that the process that Jesus went through was his coronation day like in Psalm 2. Now every key, king needs to have an inscription above his throne so that everybody recognizes his name and it couldn't be any different than Jesus. 
Notice John chapter 19 and verse 19 and we'll also read verse 20. Psalm, uh, John rather 19 and verses 19 and 20. It's beautiful to hear the pages of the Bible. It's musical. It says there, Now Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross. And the writing was, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Interesting. But there's another very interesting detail about this. Notice the following verse, verse 20. Then many of the Jews read this title, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and notice this, and it was written in Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. Was Jesus only the king of the Jews? No. The inscription above his head that said Jesus the king of the Jews is actually in three languages, the main languages of that day and age in the known world. Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. In other words, this king is not only the king of the Jews, this king is the king of what? He's the king of the world. He's the king of everyone. Whether it be Jew, or whether it be Greek, or whether it be Gentile, whatever, he's the king of all. And so we have this strange description of Jesus as king. Now have you noticed in all of this that Jesus is actually a suffering king? in everything that we've studied? a sorrowful king? a humiliated king? and yet scripture presents him as king because he is king by what he's doing, by humbling himself he's taking away the throne from the ruler of this world who took it from Adam and he is recovering the throne by what he is doing but he's not doing it by force he's doing it by becoming nothing by emptying himself, by humbling himself. Now scripture presents Jesus in a different light in other passages. It presents him, for example, in Matthew 25 and verse 31 as a king seated on a glorious throne with a crown according to Revelation chapter 19 within a crown on his head are many diadems is what scripture says this is a different kind of king no longer mocking Christ no longer a crown of thorns no longer a cross as his throne but rather sitting on a throne of glory with a glorious crown on his head let's read about that in Matthew chapter 25 and verse 31 when the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the holy angels with Him then He will sit on the throne of His glory and do you know that scripture says that those who mocked Him, those who pierced Him will wail over him when they see him seated on his glorious throne with his glorious crown on his head. Different kind of king. Now you remember that in our last study together we talked about upward mobility and downward mobility. Most of the world operates by the rule of upward mobility. But the kingdom of Christ operates on the basis of downward mobility. He who humbles himself will be what? Will be exalted. And in the case of Jesus, we find an illustration of this principle very clear. Before Jesus can sit on a glorious throne, with a glorious crown on his head, he must come down and he must have a crown of thorns and he must sit on a crown or rest on a crown which is actually a cross and his hands and his feet and his side being pierced. In other words, before he can reign, 
he must humble himself and he must become a servant you see this is how we explain the two thrones and the two crowns the two crowns of Jesus he's first of all the suffering servant and then he becomes the sovereign Lord as a result of humbling himself let's read that passage again in Philippians chapter 2 and verses 5 through 11 Philippians chapter 2 and verses 5 through 11 which we looked at last time but let's look at it again because here we have the, the law of life and death if Jesus had remained on his glorious throne in heaven we would all be lost but because he came down we all have the hope of everlasting life notice Philippians 2 verse 5 let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God actually he did not consider his equality with God as something to be hung on to as something to be grasped but made himself notice this was his choice he made himself of no reputation actually he emptied himself he said father not I but you he made himself of no reputation taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men and being found in the appearance as a man see he's already a man he's going to humble himself even more he humbled himself there it is again himself it's his choice he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death even the death on the cross even that throne the throne of the cross even that crown, the crown of thorns, even the mocking cries of the people he humbled himself, he emptied himself, he went to the cross what did God do as a result of that? notice verse 9 did Jesus go to heaven and say, okay father I went down and I did it now I want my just due come on give me my name give me my throne back no he who humbles himself will be exalted see you don't, you don't do the exalting God does he who humbles himself will be exalted and he who exalts himself somebody else will do it also the humbling will be humbled that's the law of life and death you humble yourself life you exalt yourself death it's that simple notice verse 9 therefore God also has highly exalted him, did he exalt himself? no God did, God has highly exalted him and given him the name, who gave him the name? did he grab the name? no, it says and given him a name which is above every name that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father not even to his own glory but to the glory of his Father are you catching a picture here? he humbles himself and his Father gives him a name his Father exalts him and it's all not for his glory it's for the glory of whom? it's for the glory of his Father now how does this impact us? you know many times we want to rule before we pay our dues we want to be up here before we're willing to humble ourselves in fact the text that we read last sermon last Sabbath Matthew 23 verse 12 has the essence of the teachings of Jesus if you miss a lot of the things that Jesus said and you understand this verse you understand the most important concept that Jesus taught, he who exalts himself will be some humbled and he who humbles himself will be exalted and the life of Jesus is a living illustration of this principle and the question is what about us? do we have to follow the same process that Jesus did? of course we do actually Jesus is giving us an example, he's saying as I have humbled myself you humble yourselves too that as I was exalted someday you might be exalted with me as well you see we can never occupy the throne until we have carried the cross 
we can never be exalted unless first we have humbled ourselves you know there are many illustrations of this in scripture you have the life of Joseph Joseph was up here nice at home and, and God said hey you have to go over to Egypt and become a servant and so Joseph goes he's faithful as a servant he's faithful as a slave he ends, ends up even in prison and so God says okay now you've learned the lesson of being humble now I'm going to exalt you and he places him as the prime minister of Egypt do you think he would have been ready to be prime minister of Egypt unless he had paid his dues? absolutely not you have the story of the transfiguration see the disciples they thought that Jesus was going to sit on the throne he was going to destroy the Romans he was going to be up here first Jesus says no 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 I have to go to Jerusalem they're going to mock me they're going to spit in my face and they're going to crucify me but then I'll tell you what after I'm crucified I'm going to resurrect and God is going to exalt me so you see first Jesus says I must die and then he's seen in his kingdom with Moses and Elijah who represent a mini kingdom Moses those who died in Christ and resurrected and Elijah those who will be transported to heaven from among the living Jesus is saying to the disciples listen I know you're all dejected because I said I was going to Jerusalem I was going to be mistreated and I was going to die but lift up your spirits look this is the way it's going to be this is the way the kingdom is going to be I am going to be glorified like you see me here on the Mount of Transfiguration and Moses and Elijah representing the whole human race are going to be with me wow but first comes the humbling and then comes the exalting we have the same thing in Daniel chapter 7 you know it talks about the saints of God being trampled upon and being mistreated but then the time of the judgment comes see they've been stepped on they've lost everything they've been burned at the stake their goods have been confiscated they've been hung they've been stamped on but then in the judgment we find the kingdom is given to Jesus and to the saints of the Most High and they shall rule forever and ever so don't you think that suffering is so bad? don't you think that humbling is so bad? because only those who know the lesson of humility will ever be exalted it's a law of life notice the way the Apostle Paul expresses this in 2nd Timothy chapter 2 and verse 12 2nd Timothy chapter 2 and verse 12 he gives us this maxim he gives us this formula which has to be fulfilled 2nd Timothy chapter 2 and verse 12 the Apostle Paul says this is a faithful saying for if we died with him we shall also live with him now notice if we endure other versions translate if we suffer we shall also what? we shall also reign with him so what's the necessary requisite for reigning with him? going through suffering now through trials, through tribulations, through difficulties and folks as we go through the trials and tribulations and difficulties in a humble way we learn great lessons that will, that will make us capable of handling the greater responsibilities because he who is faithful in little will eventually be faithful in what? in much I'd like to end by reading 2 Corinthians 4 17 and 18 where the Apostle Paul is describing his own experience he says for our light affliction which is but for a moment what's for a moment? our light what? oh pastor you don't know how much I'm suffering Apostle Paul says for our light affliction which is but for a moment I mean what are 70 or 80 years in the, con in the context of eternity? is working for us, notice that, that our light affliction for, but for a moment is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory while we do not look at the things which are seen those are the things, the light affliction but for a moment we do not look at the things that are seen 
but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. I pray to God that He will help us learn this lesson, folks. That he who humbles himself will be exalted, and he who exalts himself will be humbled.